Hello everyone, my name's Ian Gorton and this is the first of three lessons that cover the materials in Chapter 2 of the Foundations of Scalable Systems. You can regard this as a 30,000 foot or 10,000 meter view of scalable distributed systems and I'll take you on a tour of the main architectural approaches used for scaling a system. The type of system this lesson is oriented towards are the internet facing systems that we all utilize every day. And I'll let you name your favorite. These systems accept requests from users through web or mobile interfaces and they store and retrieve data based on user requests or events that are generated from devices such as GPS enabled watches. They also typically have some intelligent features such as providing recommendations or notifications based on previous user interactions. Virtually all massive scale systems start off small and they grow because they're successful. Teams start with a development framework such as Ruby on Rails or Django and these promote rapid application development to get systems up and running quickly. New features are the priority, agile mantras such as the Yagni principle rule. We're basically trading off speed of new feature delivery against future scalability and availability needs. These properties are only going to be used and useful if your system actually is successful and becomes heavily used. A typical simple software architecture for starter systems which closely resembles what you get with rapid development frameworks is shown here on the slide. It comprises a client tier, an application service tier and a database tier. If you use Rails or equivalent, you get a framework which hardwires a model view controller pattern for web application processing and an object relational mapper that generates SQL queries for you. With this architecture, users submit requests to the application from their mobile app or web browser. The magic of internet networking delivers these requests to the application service, which is running on a machine hosted in some corporate or commercial data center. Communications use as standard application level networking protocols, typically HTTP. The application service runs code that supports an application programming interface, an API, that specifies how clients format requests and where they send HTTP requests to. Upon receipt of a request, the service executes the code associated with the requested API. In the process, it may read or write from a database or some other external system, depending on the semantics of the API. The application service exploits a server execution environment that enables multiple requests from multiple users to be processed simultaneously. When a request is complete, the service sends the results to the client to display in their app or in their browser. Many, if not most systems conceptually look exactly like this architecturally. There's a myriad of application server technologies such as the Java Enterprise Edition and Spring for Java, Flask for Python and many, many more that are widely used to build applications. If request loads stay relatively low, this application architecture suffices. The service has the capacity to process requests with consistently low latencies. But if request loads keep growing, this means latencies will increase as the service has insufficient CPU and memory capacity for the concurrent request volume, and hence requests just start to take longer. In these circumstances, a single server becomes overloaded. It's a bottleneck. In this case, the first strategy for scaling is usually to scale up the application service hardware. This is also known as vertical scaling. For example, if your application is running on AWS, you might upgrade your server from a modest T3 X large instance with four virtual CPUs and 16 gigs of memory to a T3 2 X large instance, which doubles the number of CPUs and memory available for the application. Scale up simple, I guess many real world applications a long way to supporting much larger workloads. The downside of scaling up is it obviously costs more money for your hardware but that's scaling for you. And of course, every time you scale up, you increase your capacity, but it's still finite. One day it probably won't be enough and you'll have your Groundhog Day when you have to scale up again. It's inevitable that many applications, the load will grow to a level which will swamp a single server node, no matter how many CPUs and how much memory you have. That's when you need a new strategy, namely scaling out or horizontal scaling. Scaling out relies on the ability to replicate a service in the architecture and run multiple copies on multiple server nodes. 
requests from clients are distributed across the replicas so that in theory, if we have n replicas, each server node processes the number of requests over n. Basically, the requests are shared evenly across the replicas. This simple strategy increases an application's capacity and hence scalability. This slide depicts a simple scale out scenario based on three service replicas. In order to make scale out effective, we need two key ingredients though, this load balancer and stateless services. Let's look at these two in turn. When we scale out a system, all user requests are sent to a load balancer, which chooses a service replica target to process the request. Various strategies exist for choosing as target service, or with the core aim of keeping each resource equally busy. The load balancer also relays the responses from the service back to the client. A load balancer therefore adds an extra network hop for each request and hence needs to be extremely low latency to minimize the overheads introduced. There are a bunch of off-the-shelf load balancing solutions as well as cloud provider specific ones and I'll cover some general characteristics of some of these in a later lesson. For load balancing to be effective and share requests evenly across the replicas, the load balancer must be free to send consecutive requests from the same client to different service instances for processing. This means the API implementations in our services must maintain no knowledge or state associated with an individual client session. A classic example of this session state is something like a shopping cart that we use online. To achieve this, the state must be stored somewhere where all service replicators can manipulate it. When a user creates a session, it's allocated a unique ID that can be used to track the session state. The data representing the current contents of the state, e.g. the user's shopping cart, is then stored externally in a session store, as shown on the slide here, such that any service replica can locate this state when it receives a request as part of the user's session. Services that externalize session states are known as stateless services, and we'll return to how we design and implement this particular pattern in later lessons. Scale out is attractive because in theory, you can just keep adding new hardware and services to handle increased request loads and keep request latencies consistent and low. As soon as you see latencies rising, you deploy another service instance. This doesn't require any code changes with stateless services and is hence a relatively cheap. You're just paying for the hardware you deploy. Scale out has another highly attractive feature. If one of the services fails, the request it's processing at that particular instance will of course be lost. But as the failed service manages no session state, these requests can be simply reissued by the client and sent to another service instance for processing. This means the application is resilient to failures in the service software and hardware, and this enhances the application's availability. So in this lesson, I've just covered the basics of how we scale the processing tier of our systems. Next, I'm going to start talking about how we scale the data tier. Thanks for watching.